So <clears throat> uh, I think my, so I'm going to be presenting something very slightly different to what was actually in the, in the abstract that I submitted. Um, because while trying to uh, prepare the talk, I thought it would be nice to really give some motivation for these ideas to explain why this is something that makes sense to do. Um, uh, but when I tried to do that, I accidentally uh, improved the results. Um, so I will be talking on uh, some, some, some rather fresh work, which should be, uh, uh, should be available on the archive very soon. Um, and uh, because it's a little hot off the press, uh, it may be um, perhaps uh, a, a little harder, for, for, certainly for me to follow. Um, and so I anticipate that uh, a lot of people may feel the need to sort of um, uh, skip back and forth or interrupt with questions. Um, uh, and I'm very much in favor of that. Um, and uh, to, to help with that, um, I th think I have set it up uh, so that you can actually not just, um, so that you can actually simultaneously view the, si the slide that I am currently writing on and any annotations that I'm making live and also go back and see previous slides. Um, so I think I've put a link in the chat, which uh, should enable you to do this. Um, uh, and there is, there is a disclaimer there. Um, so if, if you log in, if you click that link and you are not logged into a Google account on your device, you will be anonymous. But if you are logged into a Google account on your device, then other users will be able to see uh, what Google account you're using to view these slides. So just from a privacy point of view, um, uh, and I, I, that your Google account name may be displayed on the recorded screen. Um, so, so if you're logged into a Google account, please be aware uh, you are not anonymous when you click that link. Um, okay. Uh, right. So, wonderful. Um, let's get started. Um, so this is the uh, this is the background to what I want to talk about. Um, so we've seen uh, we've seen two of the, of the of the great sort of setups for the circle method today. Uh, so Waring's problem slash diagonal forms, and uh, uh, and the, the problems over function fields. Um, and this is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Is very much in in the in in uh, another sort of. Uh, storage tradition in the circle method, um, namely that of uh, this, that, that, that established by this theorem of Birch. Um, so uh, the, the setup here um, is that we have a number of homogeneous equations with integer uh, coefficients to be solved in integers. Um, uh, but they're not necessarily diagonal. They don't necessarily have any, any special shape. Um, uh, the only condition we are going to impose is that they're sort of geometrically nice in a sense that I'll discuss, um, and that they are, uh, and that there are sufficiently many variables. Or if you think about this uh, sort of geometrically, um, then the, the, then the dimension is is sufficiently large. Um, so let me say more more precisely what this means. Um, and I'm aware that some of the text on this slide is a bit smaller. I'm going to try not to do that. Uh, too often, um, but if you are viewing this in, um, well, however you're viewing this, uh, I encourage you to have a go at, at, at pinching to zoom or use a scroll wheel on your mouse or whatever your device allows uh, to make sure that you, uh, that you can see whatever you want to see. Okay, so here's the setup then. Um, so we have vector f. Um, so I write, uh, let me get some, uh, some kind of nice vibrant color, there we go. Um, so vector f, uh, I write arrows over things to show that they're vectors, is, is a vector of capital R homogeneous forms with integer coefficients um, in little n it variables, and these variables we should think of as integers. All of these forms have the same degree d, which is at least two, so that we're not doing linear algebra. Um, so here, just so that we're all on the same page, uh, this thing looks in fully expanded form like this. Um, so it is a 
vector of a uh, vector of polynomials in a vector of variables. Okay. And uh, so we're interested in the integer solutions. Um, and in particular, uh, the integer solutions of uh, bounded height. So we look for integer solutions in integers of size at most capital P. Um, Excuse me while I just fix something here. Uh, okay, that looks like it's working for me. Um, okay, and um, right, yes. And so the result then um, is that uh, provided this system of forms is non-singular, so geometrically nice in some sense, and the number of variables is sufficiently large. Um, and uh, so I've got to fix this typo. That should not be an N there. Um, so sufficient, the number of variables should be sufficiently large in terms of the degree of the forms and the number of forms. Um, so let's ignore, ignore that. Um, then we have a nice asymptotic for the number of, uh, of solutions in integers of bounded height. Um, and uh, so we have, so the asymptotic is of this size and we have some kind of leading constant, um, which is positive, meaning that we have infinitely many solutions uh, provided that there are some local solutions. Um, and there's some, uh, there's some small print to the effect that um, uh, the, the, the homogeneous part of the uh, conditions here isn't strictly necessary and that there's a version without that assumption. Um, uh, but I don't want to get too deeply into that. Uh, what I do want to comment is that what non-singular means here, um, the way that I have stated this result, uh, is sort of the naive meaning of non-singular. Uh, so the Jacobian matrix um, of this system of forms should have full rank at every complex solution to these equations. Um, okay, also known as defining a non-singular variety. Okay. Um, uh, and we're interested in particular um, in improving the number of variables involved here. Let me uh, again just clean up the mess that I left behind by scrubbing out these things that shouldn't be there. Um, uh, so we were interested in, in improving this number of variables. Um, so in particular, the number of variables that you need uh, for Birch's result to apply uh, is quadratic in the number of forms and it's exponential in the degree of those forms. Um, and so we'd like to do better in some sense. Uh, and in particular, we'd like to do better in the case of a system of several forms. Um, so, um, so the only the only result that I'm aware of which uh, really captures what I mean by uh, do better for a system of separate of several forms um, is is this result of Munchy. Um, so what I mean is this function n naught of d and r, the number of variables you need for a system of d forms in r variables to have this nice asymptotic if it's non-singular, um, should, be, should be reduced without, uh, without introducing any other hypotheses with exactly these hypotheses, so just changing the value of n naught. Um, uh, so in this case, the, the, the the only result that isn't obtained by the means that I'm going to talk about in this series of lectures uh, that I'm aware of um, is this result of Munchy for a pair of quadratic forms. So it's a non-singular complete intersection of, of um, two quadratic forms uh, in 11 or more variables. Okay. Um, and uh, there, are, there are, however, um, so the reason that I'm, picking out this case um, is that this is very different to the situation when we have a single form. 
And so if we're looking at a single form, there's a, there's a considerable uh, and, and, and very beautiful literature um, on how to improve this n naught in the case when r is one. Um, and, there, and there are many interesting improvements, um, but for reasons that we will, uh, uh, we will get to talk about, these improvements don't extend so easily to the case of a system of several forms. Okay. Um, so here are here are some. Uh, I, I mentioned that I wanted to keep the hypotheses exactly the same and just improve this value of n naught. Um, and uh, there are some results which I think are. Are, are very relevant um, in the sense that, uh, well, in some sense, they come very close to doing this, um, but they have some uh, additional, con the, 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 the particular uh, way the results, um, the, the methods are implied in these papers, uh, put some additional constraints on the shape of the forms involved. Um, uh, so um, even these, um, even these results where we put some uh, sort of relatively familiar or benign constraints on the shape of the forms um, still apply only to systems of at most three uh, forms with the present state of the art. Okay. Um, there is actually, so I skipped over, um, something that I may come back to, um, there is uh, one result which, which, very near, which very nearly qualifies for the kind of improvement that I'm talking about, um, in the sense that uh, although it, it doesn't work for all non-singular systems F, um, uh, I think one expects that it should work for most of them. Um, so that's something that, 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 I, that I might mention if we have time, because it, it's an interesting uh, sort of contrast with some of the things I'll be talking about. Um, but we'll come back to that. Um, what I want to talk about is, uh, is this result, um, which almost delivers exactly what we're asking for. Um, so this is, this is a result of, of Muller, um, and it is based uh, on the work of, of uh, Friedmanus Bank, Bankus and Friedrich Goethe. Um, and this is a result for systems of forms with real coefficients. Um, so in this case, it is not reasonable to look for, or it, it is perhaps I should say very difficult rather than not reasonable to understand the solutions to uh, f of x equal to zero if f has some, uh, some general real coefficients. Um, and so instead one might ask uh, for something like this. Um, one might ask for each of the forms to have absolute value at most one. So this is some kind of Diophantine approximation problem. Um, so in this setting, uh, one can actually um, get a number um, with, with the other hypotheses being the same. So the non-singularity condition is the same. Um, and here, instead of equals zero, which has absolute value at most one, um, one can get an analogous result. Um, and one should also delete, uh, if, one, if one's really uh, checking through, one should also delete this condition about QP because the p-adic numbers aren't going to be relevant, but that's the... Uh, let's leave that to one side. Um, the point is that one can obtain an essentially equivalent result, um, morally the same type of result, as soon as the number of variables is at least nine R, so nine times the number of forms. Um, um, and uh, so this is this is considerably better. So this is only for quadratic forms, I should emphasize. Um, but this, this looks considerably better in, in, in one respect because this is quadratic in R and this is linear. Um, so when capital R is sufficiently large, uh, this is going to be better. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty intriguing given that most other methods seem to be particularly difficult to apply when capital R is large. And most other ways to improve on Birch's result, I mean. Um, okay. Uh, so, how is this? How is this possible? How, how is it possible that um, this 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 seems like a, a 
one of the more difficult cases in which to improve Berger's results. Um, and yet in this slightly different problem of, of Diophantine approximation, um, there's something that's much better precisely when capital R is large. Um, well, uh, that's sort of what I, uh, what I want to explore. Um, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a spoiler, um, but by sort of modif by, by doing something which, which morally is inspired by the work of Bankus and Goetze and, and Muller, um, uh, one can in fact get this result. And so one can get a, a, a nice clean number of variables um, with a linear scaling in the number of forms. Um, so this, um, if the if the number of vari if the number of if the if the degree is at least four, um, then this improves on Birch's result as soon as we have a pair of forms. Um, so for degree four and higher, and a system with several forms, this this immediately improves on Birch's result, uh, which I've written in this in this slightly awkward way out of a. Uh, perhaps misguided desire for concision, um, and if the degree is uh, if the degree is lower than four, um, then uh, one needs slightly more forms, uh, slightly larger capital R in order for this to improve on Birch's result. Um, and actually, the case with d less than four um, is already known, uh, even in a, a microscopically stronger form uh, by some previous work of mine. Um, okay, um, so the, the main take home here is that by taking this, the, the, this idea underlying the work, of, this idea which was introduced by Bankus and Goetze, and which underlies the work of Muller, um, one can take this, uh, this result of Birch, and one can get a linear dependence instead of a quadratic dependence of the number of variables on the number of forms. Um, okay. Uh, so could I ask uh, somebody to just copy and paste the message I put in the chat into the chat again for any late arrivals? Thank you. Um, sure. Great. Um, and I've noticed I, 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 have a, I have a screen on the side that, I, that I'm uh, trying to watch the, um, uh, this link on, and it looks like it does sometimes freeze. So if, you may sometimes need to refresh it. But it looks like refresh. If it freezes, it looks like refreshing the page fixes the problem. Okay. Um, right. So. Um, so this is okay. So there's a couple of slides about or as the result that I mentioned I was going to going to skip over, um, which we may come back to later. What I want to progress on to now is talking about the proof. How is Birch's result proved? Um, and uh, where, is the, where is the room for improvement? Um, what, is, uh, what, is the, um, uh, what is the what is the motor which drives these improvements? Uh, so here is the here is the setup in the in the notation that I'm going to use. Um, so we have uh, again capital R uh, homogeneous forms with integer coefficients. Uh, there's this condition that they're linearly independent hovering around, which is uh, useful for some reasons that we'll get to. Um, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, linearly independent really just means that there's no, um, there's no linear combination uh, of these forms, um, which is zero uh, independently of the variables. So uniformly zero or zero as a system of R polynomials, uh, as a system of, uh, as, a, as a polynomial, excuse me, um, right, like so. Um, uh, so in other words, if, if you take a linear combination of these with rational or, or real or complex coefficients, it doesn't matter, um, then your coefficients should all vanish, so just the ordinary idea of linear independent, but in this uh, in this space here. Um, uh, I suppose I should put maybe Q of X or something. Um, okay. Um, right, and I also want to warn you of my fondness for dot product notation, 
Um, so this thing that I've written up here, I would usually just write as alpha dot f. Um, so meaning what, I, what I've put here. So then the central object that we're going to study is this exponential sum, which, which you've seen floating around before today. Now written in a slightly different way. Um, so uh, because of the nature of some of the arguments that, that we're going to do, um, it's, it's convenient in this series of talks to write the exponential sum uh, as a function of a polynomial rather than of um, a real parameter. Um, so s of alpha dot f, so alpha dot f is, is, uh, is a polynomial. Uh, alpha is, is real, so it's in it's a polynomial real coefficients. Um, and what this s of alpha dot f means is it means take that polynomial um, and sum it, uh, oh, sum e to the two pi i times the value of that polynomial over all the values of the variables, uh, integers, uh, most p. Okay, so it's the usual thing, but I've written it as a function of alpha dot f instead of as a function of alpha, and I'm still going to speak of it informally as depending on alpha because we think of f as fixed. Um, so this is just a, just a notational quirk. Um, okay. Um, so the uh, counting function that we're interested in, which I've repeated up here. Uh, we can write it uh, by, by orthogonality. We can write it like this as the integral of this exponential sum over the hypercube. Um, and then in the way that's already been discussed today, we want to split this into major and minor arcs. Um, so we want to find uh, some sort of major arcs, which in this case has the form that I've written here. Um, and you know, the, the, if, you, if you're concerned, the exact definition isn't necessarily too important. Um, uh, the, the, the important thing is the idea that this is the points in the hypercube, which are close to a rational vector of, of small, uh, small common denominator. Um, okay, uh, so this here is a, is a rational vector of small common denominator, some integer vector divided by some integer a little q, which is not too big. Um, and how close you have to be and how large the denominator can be are controlled by a parameter capital Q, um, which appears in the, in the notation for the major arcs. Um, and here it should be a small power, sufficiently small power of the size of our variables. Okay, um, so this is, this is nearly the, uh, uh, the notation for the circle method I'm setting up. Okay, um, and what we want to do is show that if the number of variables is sufficiently large, um, then the major arcs capture the expected size of this counting function, um, and the minor arcs are an error term, so they're, they're smaller than the, the count than the, than the expected size of the counting function uh, by some small power of the parameter capital P. Um, okay, so this is this is the asymptotic we want. When p becomes large, we want the uh, this counting function, this number of solutions, to be this plus a small error term. Okay. Um, and uh, I've put some absolute value signs inside here to indicate that we're not we're, we're only going to worry about the the absolute value of this exponential sum when we're on the minor arcs. Um, we're not going to try to uh, extract additional cancellation. Um, uh, by thinking about this exponential sum as really a complex number. We're just going to look at how big it is on the minor arcs. Um, and I've put a, a little, so in the course, so usually in the circle method, um, one would uh, sort of always think of the major arcs as having a parameter capital Q in here, um, which is a, a small power of the governing parameter P. Um, and, uh, um, so in Berkeley's version of the circle method, that's not always true. So sometimes you will see a, a set of major arcs floating about with a, a rather large parameter uh, as an argument. Um, and uh, this, for some people uh, perfectly reasonably find this a bit disorienting. Um, uh, 
and uh, I suppose the, the the moral is that um, if if you want to if you want to um, be able to, to to talk to the maximal number of circle method people without without confusion, um, then one should one should assert that um, although this capital M is the symbol we usually use for the major arcs, uh, M of Q is only really a set of major arcs if the parameter capital Q is small. Um, otherwise, it's more like a set of minor arcs uh, because then we're allowing uh, we're allowing points that are rather far away from a rational vector of rather large common denominator, points that don't look so special. Um, okay. Uh, um, so then, uh, having set this up, uh, this is the sort of, uh, this is the form of Birch's method that underlies the work of Bankus and Goetze, I would say. Um, so that's a slight mangling of the history. Um, uh, I mean, this, 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 is the, uh, this is a kind of formalization of Birch's method, uh, trying to extract the, the minimum hypothesis that one needs for Birch's method to work. Um, others have, have tried to do this. Um, uh, it never actually captures the, 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 the maximal generality in which you would want to apply Birch's ideas, um, but it still kind of seems worth a try sometimes. Um, so, okay, let me break down what's written here. So, as always, we're trying to count solutions to a system of, uh, a system of equations with integer coefficients, and we're doing it using this uh, exponential sum here, um, which is just a sum over integer points of bounded height of e to the 2 pi i times uh, the value of this form with real coefficients. And we think of it as depending on this real vector alpha. Um, and this is going to get integrated over the unit hypercube. Um, and uh, sort of the, the, the idea that I want to push is that the, the minimum information uh, that sort of uh, goes in to, uh, uh, to Berkeley's argument to extract the asymptotic that we want, which is, which is repeated down here, um, uh, is some information about purely the size of the sets where this exponential sum is large. Um, so, uh, so this here, is the Lebesgue measure of the set of points in the unit hypercube such that this exponential sum uh, is large. Uh, so the trivial bound for this exponential sum uh, is um, p to the n. Um, so I, I, there, I know that there are uh, different conventions here um, but just to reiterate, um, uh, uh, so this less than less than notation is, is the same as, as big O notation. Um, so it means that the thing on the left hand side is bounded in absolute value by a constant times the right hand side. Um, okay. So this bound is trivial because the number of sums here is, is just the number of integer points of, of size up to capital P. They're in N space, so there are about P to the capital N of them. Um, and each of these terms being summed has magnitude exactly one. It's e to the two pi i times something. So it's a point on the unit, complex unit circle. Um, so what's going on here is that we're making some kind of assertion about the uh, set on which this exponential sum is large, um, where large means that we save about capital P to the K over the trivial bound. Okay, it occurs to me that perhaps I should have been calling out the slide number for the benefit of people following on the, uh, uh, on the uh, more elaborate online system. I'm currently on slide 10. Um, okay. Um, so 
what this is saying is that if we look at the points in the unit hypercube, um, where the exponential sum saves uh, no more than about p to the k over the trivial bound, um, so this epsilon isn't so important and one shouldn't worry about it. Um, uh, the important thing is that the, is that s should be no more than than uh, p to the k times smaller than the trivial bound. Um, then this measure is bounded by this quantity here. So capital C is just some fixed constant. Um, uh, yes, so one, one should not worry either about the value of capital C, it's just some fixed constant that depends on uh, this, this sort of thing, the, the size of the coefficients of the forms, the number of variables, that sort of thing. Um, um, and since the form, if the form is fixed in particular, this capital C is going to end up being fixed, so one shouldn't worry about it. Um, okay, so the trivial bound for this measure is one, um, because it's Lebesgue measure and it's a set which lies entirely inside this unit hypercube. Um, so uh, this right hand side is, is only going to be smaller than one uh, when this parameter k uh, is less than dr divided by little c. So little c here is another constant in the, in the, in the hypothesis. And it, it is going to matter in the end how large little c is, um, but one can one can still think of it as just a, a, a constant that depends only on the system of forms you have in hand. Um, so actually, the whole game is going to be uh, the whole game is going to be to get a um, uh, so, um, the important thing is that we just need a value of little c, which is between zero and one, and one can think of it as a constant. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, where was I? But yes, the trivial bound for this measure. Um, so if, if k is in this range here, um, then that means exactly that this exponent here is negative. Um, and since capital C is a constant and capital P is very large, um, C times P to something negative, uh, this is going to be very small, much less than one. Um, so uh, this hypothesis on K here, um, this, this, isn't, uh, this isn't really a big deal. Uh, this is just telling us that we're actually in a regime where this, this bound here is non-trivial. Simon, in particular, you this mean- This bound is a hypothesis. It's something that we, we, we're going to need to go out to prove. Um, I'm sorry, just say that again? Simon, I mean, you, you need this for every real k in that range? Uh, that's correct, yes. Despite the fact that k is popularly an integer, um, k here is, is really a real number. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, yes, I, 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 I ran out of, I ran out of that, as sometimes happens, and so k here is a real number. Um, okay. Right, yes. Um, okay, so in other words, uh, uh, what we're getting at is that this n minus k is just there so that this, the one bound is, is uh, sort of non-trivial or, or has a sensible comparison to the trivial bound. Um, and this condition is just there so that the hypothesis as a whole is non-trivial. Uh, so really, the, the, the actual surprising part of this, the, the part that uh, deserves some explanation, um, which I'm not really going to be able to give for a while, um, is that we have this special form on the right-hand side, uh, that we have a bound um, for the measure of the set where this exponential sum is large, um, which scales like, uh, which as we change how large we require the exponential sum to be, um, this bound scales like a, like a power of that saving. Um, uh, it scales like p to the k to the little c. Um, okay, so uh, what I can say, um, 
is that one, one might uh, have some suspicions about what's going on here um, uh, based on uh, what, what appears next. Um, so this is the this 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 thing here is the hypothesis, and the conclusion is just the conclusion of Birch's theorem, um, so that we get the correct asymptotic for the counting function that we care about. Um, um, and the fact that little c uh, is strictly less than one uh, will ensure um, that. Uh, it will ensure um, that when, so on the major arcs, we want to think of the exponential sum as having similar size to the main term itself. Um, uh, so, sorry, on the, on the exponential, uh, on the major arcs, we want to think of the exponential sum as having similar size to the trivial bound. Um, and, uh, therefore, the major arcs ought to have a uh, measure. So on the major arcs, the exponential sum ought to be sort of roughly as large as the trivial bound, at least a positive proportion of the time. Um, and the measure of the major arcs should be something like uh, p, to the n, uh, p to the minus dr. Um, so that that trivial bound is multiplied by that measure um, to get uh, roughly the size of the main term we expect. Um, okay. Um, so at one extreme, this bound encodes, uh, encodes that sort of heuristic expectation um, that the, the exponential sum should be roughly as large as the trivial bound, uh, that is when little k is zero, um, uh, on a set of measure around p to the uh, minus dr, which is what this will be when k is zero. Um, and uh, so the other extreme that we might care about um, the other extreme that we might care about is what happens when uh, the exponential sum has size, um, about as large as uh, about as large as the main term itself. Um, so if the exponential sum was this large everywhere, um, we would be completely stymied. If the exponential sum, perhaps imagining some kind of worst case disaster, if the exponential sum never got smaller um, than uh, than this this size here, um, then our strategy would be completely sunk um, because uh, we want to take some kind of integral of the absolute value of the exponential sum over the minor arcs. Um, and if uh, on the whole of these minor arcs, which have measure around one, um, uh, the exponential sum had this size, then the minor arc contribution um, would have size around p to the n minus dr, which would be very bad for us um, because we want this to be smaller than our main term. We want it to be an error term. Um, so at the other extreme, uh, what this hypothesis is encoding um, is that when, uh, when capital K, um, is around d times r, um, this, this bound should be, uh, should be small. Um, so uh, when capital K is of size d times r, this bound here looks something like p to the c minus one times d times r. And our hypothesis that little c is smaller than one ensures that this is a negative exponent. Um, and since capital P is large, uh, that means this measure is very small. Um, 
So what's going on with this hypothesis really is it's interpolating between the size that we know the exponential sum ought to be on the major arcs or that we expect it ought to be on the major arcs a positive proportion of the time um, and the size that we really hope it isn't on the minor arcs. Um, so at so one extreme, uh, it's what we expect on the major arcs. At the other extreme, it says that we can't have uh, a, a really terrible situation where on the whole of the minor arcs, um, the exponential sum has size comparable to our expected main term. Um, okay. And the perhaps surprising conclusion um, is that uh, um, I see that my video has dropped out. Um, well, I will start video on another device so that at least those who really want to can see my face. Um, my audio is still all right, I take it? Good. Um, okay. Um, um, so, the uh so there we go yes right so it interpolates between between these two things um and the the crucial thing um is that uh, to run Berkeley's argument this information is enough we really don't need to know anything more than this uh, which i i find a little surprising um because this information is very uh, it's not very arithmetic looking it doesn't really tell us anything number theoretic looking about these forms, um, at least not to me. Um, okay. Uh, so what I want to do in the uh, rest of this talk um, is um, talk about uh, the proof of, of this formalization um, of part of uh, Birch's method. Um, and uh, I want to prove this result, um, and then in the remaining talks in the series, I'll talk about how one might go about proving this bound here. Um, and um, uh, the uh, so on the on the on the next slide in, in in the proof, I'm going to suppress some things which I, I hope people have seen enough now. Um, and you can click the link in the chat to go back and see the definitions if you need to. Some things highlighted in, in pink are going to be suppressed in the, in the proof. Um, uh, this notation here. Okay. Um, so here is the first part of the proof. And this is only going to be a sketch because we, we, we don't have time to go into all the details. Um, but uh, the idea here um, is let's let's is that we should first do the minor arcs, um, and then the major arc bound uh, the, the the major arc asymptotic will perhaps surprisingly follow from the minor arc asymptotic. Um, and there is I I want to emphasize nothing uh, particularly original about this. Um, I think if 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 you if you had gone back and if you well uh, I I. I um, I think if you went and asked Birch what he would have thought of this when he when he published his his paper in in, in 1962, um, I think I, I I don't know that he would he would claim that he would have been that surprised. All the um all the underlying tools are, are there in the original paper. This is just a different way of putting it. Um, okay. Um, so here's the idea. On the minor arcs, we want to get uh, this upper bound here. So we want it to be smaller than the main term by, by a power of, uh, of P. Um, uh, and these various nu's and deltas are just some sufficiently small constants. Uh, and to do this, uh, I want to, to invoke a, a result which is uh, due to Dietman and also to Schindler, um, which a special case of this result says that as soon as the forms are linearly independent, um, we have some, uh, some non-trivial upper bound on the minor arcs. Um, uh, so I suppose I should have put a plus epsilon there, but um, uh, yes, that, that, that is not, not, uh, not something to be worried about. Um, 
Okay, so that is why I put the hypothesis in at the start that the system of forms is always linearly independent. Um, uh, this, this, this simplifies things because one, one immediately, just from this fact, um, one now knows that, uh, and I suppose this is the one thing which, which isn't there in Birch's original work, um, uh, and which, which, which might, have been, uh, might have been surprising at the time. Um, uh, so as soon as the forms are linearly independent, um, we have some non-trivial bound on the minor arcs. Um, okay. And so if we look at the, what we're going to do is we're going to take the integral over the minor arcs. Um, so this thing here, it means um, the integral of the minor arcs with parameter uh, p to the new um, of the absolute value of s of alpha dot f uh, d alpha. Um, so these minor arcs are a subset of this unit cube. Um, and what we're doing here, um, and this is this is not something that uh, so this is this is a very uh, interesting argument, but that, that I'm not going to have time to sort of uh, justify in full detail. But this is really from Birch's uh, original paper. Um, what one should do uh, is one should um, break up this integral. Um, uh, into into dyadic ranges according to the size of the exponential sum. Um, so this sum uh, is um, so k here is again um, a real number, uh, not an integer, um, uh, and p to the k uh, in two to the z. Uh, so this means that p to the k is a power of two. Uh, Okay. Um, so what's going on here is we're summing over uh, uh, some some real values k, so that p to the k is nicely spaced in in uh, in this in this dyadic set. Um, and um, what then what we do is for for each of these nicely spaced values of of p to the k, um, we uh, we look only at the part of the integral. Um, so, so this is going to be an integral over alpha in the minor arcs such that um, the exponential sum s of alpha dot f uh, has um, has size, uh, let's see, I haven't quite left myself enough room here. Um, excuse me. Uh, somebody has select things. Oh yes, it's this tool, sorry. I'm new to this app. Um, no uh, so P to the K, S of alpha dot F, to p, uh, p to the n minus k, p to the n minus k, n minus k, okay. Um, so the idea is that we break up the integral into pieces according to the size of the integrand. Um, so we have this sum over dyadic, dyadic uh, over a dyadic uh, progression here. Um, and uh, for each p to the k in that, in that uh, dyadic set. Um, we look at the piece of the integral where the integrand s has size between p to the n minus k and 2p to the n minus k. Uh, so this is this is really just notation. Um, uh, and uh, you know this this actually is, is kind of familiar uh, from, from some ways of learning what integration is in the first place. Um, but uh, I'll leave that aside. Okay. And then these pieces, uh, so this integral is bounded. Um, so this integral is just bounded by uh, 2p to the n minus k, the maximum size of the integrand, um, times the measure of the, of the set of alpha that we're integrating over. 
Um, and in, in this set of alpha that we're integrating over, we find a condition um, that there's a lower bound on S. Um, and our hypothesis in the lemma uh, says that a set like that can't have large measure. Um, so that's basically all that's going on here. Uh, the only other thing that's happening um, is that there is um, a, a lower bound on K here, which one can, uh, it comes from, it comes from this, this part, part I, um, uh, this, this fact that the exponential sum has to be a little bit small on the minor arcs. Um, okay, uh, so one rolls that all together. Uh, one finds that one has, uh, one has a, a, a geometric progression to sum. Um, and uh, one finds that this makes the minor arc contribution satisfactory. Um, uh, so new here could actually have been anything small and the saving delta one that we get, it depends on, on, on new. Okay, um, so that's, the, that's a, a, a brief outline of how the minor arcs work. As I say, the, the, this is one should, uh, uh, one should feel um, delighted at the possibility of going back to Birchley's work and, uh, and studying this in the original form. Um, um, and uh, what about the major arcs? Um, well, um, the idea here uh, is that we want to approximate um, I suppose, as has been sort of discussed a bit already, um, on, the, on the major arcs, we want to uh, approximate the exponential sum by a kind of local object. Um, uh, and you know, again, I don't have time to say as much about this as I would like, um, but uh, the idea here um, is that if the point alpha at which we're evaluating the exponential sum is a rational vector of small denominator plus a small perturbation, um, which I, I, I've normalized it by adding a capital P to the D, but this gamma on capital P to the D, one should just think of as a small perturbation. Uh, so this is the same thing as being in the, in the major arcs. Um, alpha is a, a rational vector of small denominator plus a small uh, real vector. Um, uh, then we can uh, approximate this exponential sum by some kind of uh, some some kind of mod q exponential sum, where q is the uh, denominator of that rational vector there, uh, times some kind of um, uh, nice integral. Um, so this is supposed to be a kind of real analog of the exponential sum, whatever that means. Um, and I've sort of normalized things a bit here. Um, which has led to this fact of p to the n on q to the n out the front. Um, okay. Um, and uh, um, uh, right. So um, what one does is one substitutes this uh, this approximation. Into the uh, into the integral over the major arcs. So this thing here is is supposed to be the integral of uh, the exponential sum d alpha over the major arcs. Um, so one substitutes that in, um, and then what one wants to do is is um, Um, extract <clears throat> extract uh, something which looks like the main term we want. Uh, so something which looks like a constant times p to the n minus dr. Um, and it turns out that the thing to do is to is to complete this integral, uh, which is buzzword for um, extending the range of integration out to infinity. Um, and uh, uh, extend this sum over q which comes from the definition of the major arcs, um, uh, again, to a, to a sum over all, all Q. Um, and this is something which uh, uh, we'll certainly see, this kind of idea we'll, we'll see more in, in uh, Euro's course in, in coming days. Um, 
Okay. Um, so the uh, sort of modestly interesting fact at the, at the heart of this argument is that actually um, the bound that we already proved on the minor arcs, so the, the fact that the minor arcs are smaller than the main term, it actually gives us um, it actually gives us a bound for this uh, for the it, it gives us information about this singular integral term um, by by in fact running this approximation argument in reverse. Um, uh, so we got this expression for the integral over the major arcs by substituting this approximation into uh, this integral, um, and now we take now for now now. Uh, Strangely, it serves us to go backwards. Um, we take this integral that appears um, inside uh, inside our, our, our major arc term, um, and we uh, we want to um, put the uh, we want again to to use this approximation formula. Um, this time with the real the the a over q, we choose a equal to zero and q equal to one. Um, so that the right-hand side just looks like this integral that we want to study. Um, uh, this, this red integral that we want to study, um, it doesn't actually have the parameter of capital P in it at all, uh, which means that when we do this, we get to choose capital P, it's a, it's a parameter we can pick. Um, and uh, it turns out that um, one can use this to show that this integral here uh, it converges um, in the sense that uh, this bound on gamma um, uh, uh, can be removed. So the contribution from large gamma is small. Um, okay, so again, this is uh, going past very fast, but this is very much um, uh, something that we'll see more of in coming days. Um, and there is a, a, a very slightly more involved argument which does the same thing. Um, so I've just given names to this blue sum and this red integral that have been floating around. Um, so one, one does something microscopically more complex um, to study this, uh, this, sum over, this sum over Q here. Um, what happens is that this bound that one has proved on the uh, red integral um, is enough to uh, remove this upper bound on the size of gamma uh, while introducing only a negligible error. And then once one has done that, um, there's no dependence on little q uh, in this integral. Uh, so this sum over q um, really looks like uh, really looks like this. One can take the integral outside and, and just look at this sum over q. Um, one can apply, as I say, a, a, a slightly more uh, complicated version of this same idea um, to show that this also converges in the sense that one can remove this limitation on the size of little q while introducing only a negligible error. Um, and then one finds that one has, uh, one has automatically reduced, re removed all the dependence on capital P except for this factor capital P to the n minus dr. And this is exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to get an asymptotic for the integral over the major arcs of the form P to the n minus dr times a constant. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the idea of the proof um, of, this, of this lemma. Um, one, can one can use this, uh, this bound of deep and of, and of Schindler um, and uh, together with this uh, um, approximation on the major arcs, uh, which I, 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 I didn't tell you really how this, how this is proved, I just said that Bert showed it, um, but I will say that this is not difficult to prove. Uh, uh, so one can combine these elements in a suitable way uh, to prove um, uh, this claim that we wanted. Um, uh, did I go the wrong way? What happened here? Excuse me. Um, ah, yes. So uh, I just uh, 
exhibited some of the notation again here. Um, so these two parts are the claim that we want, uh, the bound on the minor arcs that we saw before, um, and this asymptotic on the major arcs, um, which we have in fact now proved, because we can take this p to the n minus dr out front um, and get uh, this um, lemma that we wanted to prove. Um, so this hypothesis on the measure of these sets has been used only on the, uh, has been used directly on the minor arcs and then the minor arc bound has been used um, to get the result we want on the major arcs. Um, and by putting these parts together, uh, we get the result. Um, okay, uh, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Um, and tomorrow uh, we, we, will, we will take a step back from these messy details um, and we'll talk of using this formulation, we'll talk about how, uh, how Birchley's method works, how, how, uh, in Birchley's, how the results in Birchley's paper uh, lead to a bound of, of, of this form uh, on the, these measures, um, which is sufficient to prove Birchley's result. And we'll talk about where there might be some, some room for improvement. Thank you very much, Simon, from all of us. Do we have questions for speaker?